very much. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. And welcome to this beautiful venue that we have here. And welcome, of course, to CNBC's Sustainable Future Forum, sponsored by Bain and Company. And my name is Emma Crosby. I am a presenter with CNBC Catalyst, and I'm delighted to be your host this morning. And for those of you who don't know, the CNBC Sustainable Future Forum is, in our opinion, the premier destination for business leaders such as yourself to come together and discuss the big issues and the new ideas for growing business in a sustainable world. Now, today, in parallel with the discussions that we're hearing at COP28 just down the road, we'd like to explore the theme of selling the vision. How do you, as leaders, go home from listening to all the discussions and the debates we're hearing at COP28 and sell that vision to the consumers, to society, and to stakeholders at large, especially at a time when we're seeing potentially some skepticism growing among some members of the public towards net zero goals, and also competing concerns over the global economy. Well, this morning, we've got lots and lots of food for thought for you. We've got two fantastic panels coming up in just a few minutes' time. We have a CNBC Catalyst Spotlight with the Bain CEO, Manny Maceda, and CNBC's Tanya Breyer is also going to be joining us today with a very special guest, so lots to look forward to. I'd also like to draw your attention to the networking reception that's taking place at 1 o'clock after all our conversations are finished. We've got refreshments for you and canapes, so we really hope that you can stay with us as well. Um, three housekeeping points for us to bear in mind before we start today. The first thing is just to let you know that our panels will be live streamed on uh, CNBC International's LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and X pages. So please make sure your phones are on silent if you don't mind. We really appreciate that. And for those who are sitting in the front two row seats here, um, if you don't mind staying seated once the everything's begun, just because if you pop up, you might appear on television. <laughs> <laughs> to be your, your starring role. And for those of you who are not connected to Wi-Fi, just to let you know, it is luxury collection underscore public, and there is no password if you haven't connected already. Okay, we're going to get started with our first uh, panel this morning, and we're going to continue the conversation I'm sure many of you have heard a lot already here at COP28. That is the progress that the investment community is making when it comes to help bridge the finance gap. And to lead our fantastic panel this morning, I'd like to introduce you to the co-anchor of CNBC's flagship show, Sportbox, Mr. Steve Sedgwick. A big round of applause, please, for Steve. <laughs> Hello there. Um, that's how it should be done with the magnificent Emma Crosby. This is how it's going to be done with me, and, and it, it's going to descend into chaos with me now. Um, I've been in and around TV for 20 odd years. My, all of it was CNBC, and I, it's been a real privilege. And, and as part of that, I've been to, uh, I think, the most pivotal COPs before this one COP21 in Le Bourget in Paris uh, in December 2015, and COP28 in Glasgow a, a couple of years ago. Uh, and without doubt, uh, we are absolutely right to focus on the issue of financing here uh, at this forum today because for me the biggest disappointments as a journalist and as an observer are the fact that finance has always been top of the list in terms of how we make this a global solution rather than just a rich world solution rather than just um, a solution that benefits certain echelons of society and so just focusing on the financing yet again which I believe this cop is doing actually and, and again I hope I'm not by, being naive by thinking so I, I think it's absolutely key look the intention for me is not to speak too much, by the way, because we have a great panel. So I'll tell you a couple more house rules in a few moments' time. But what we've got here, um, which you can see either side of me, a couple of big screens. We've just got a, a short introductory video, which will just frame the issue uh, of financing. And, and I hope we have a, a really lovely conversation. I know we will, because we've got a brilliant panel for you in a few moments' time. So let's just, let's just listen in to what some of the key issues are.
step up. It's time to rebuild trust based on climate justice. The just transition to a green economy. Right, when a lot of your, your video in that was people I've interviewed over the last couple of years. And, and yesterday, um, I think it was a real privilege to speak to the CEO of Exxon. Um, and the big oil uh, groups are here for the first time. And yet, I interviewed um, Greta Thunberg at Davos this year as well. Uh, and I think the, the two frame, really, two very passionate people uh, about the transition, um, but have such diverging views. And, and when I get so much criticism for, for the conversation with Thunberg, and then I'll get criticism for the conversation with uh, Darren Woods, I know I'm doing something right. <laughs> Okay, look, this panel is great. I'm just going to delay no longer because uh, I'm gonna, I've got a clock on me in a few moments' time and I don't want to waste too much time. So let me just introduce, in no particular order as well, and I'm going to see that uh, Hubert's at the front. So Hubert Keller is the Senior Managing Partner at Lombard ODA. Uh, a real privilege to see you. I, I think there is an order of Gush. Okay, so they're going to want you to sit there, sir. Nice to see you. Uh, and also Jennifer Holmgren, who is the CEO of Lanzatech. Um, Dr. Holmgren is... Uh, it's one of the smartest people I've ever met. 50 plus patents as well, so uh, designed by her as well. Uh, next, we have Henry Fernandez as well, who is the chairman and CEO of MSCI and someone I've had the privilege of speaking to uh, at a couple of cops now and uh, someone who uh, has got some amazing things to say about the data that's available and the data that should be available and the investment decisions that are being made uh, on erroneous data and lack of knowledge. And Jose Manuel Entracanales, who is the chairman and CEO of Acciona as well, uh, a man who... I've spoken to on several occasions, but not in person as well. So uh, let's just see if I'm better in person than I am um, down the line. Because it's down the line. Who likes it down the line? No one does, really. So, okay, look, okay, the clock is going to be on. I just want to say, uh, as Emma said, this is going to be live streamed as well. Um, LinkedIn and YouTube, uh, X and uh, others as well. I think Facebook as well, up there as well. Okay, uh, and... Traditionally on these events, if this incredibly smart audience wants to uh, get involved, what, what the rules are normally is that uh, you get to put your hand up for about two minutes at the end. Well, I, I don't abide by those rules. Uh, and what I like is if you hear something that you think is absolutely fascinating and you really want to get involved or you want to disagree, then by all means, l let me know. Put your hand up, give me a nod or whatever you, and I promise you I will get you into the conversation as well. Right, let us crack on. The clock started, and <laughs> I'm still talking. Um, we are having a global stock take here at COP28, and it is sobering, and it is dispiriting. And when you dig into the details of the global stock take, you look at the, the money that has been spent, which has not been as much as it should have been, but it has been dramatic, and we're still talking. I think, for instance, in, um, yes, 2021, 2022, uh, Climate Policy, Policy Initiative said that $1.3 trillion uh, was spent uh, on uh, greening initiatives. Well, that's great, $1.3 trillion. $30 billion went to developing nations, according to that same stat, out of $1.3 trillion. It's devastating, isn't it? So let's have our own global stock take to start off with as well. Uh, and in no particular order, uh, I'll, I'll start off with you, Hubert, if I may as well. Um, give us your own stock take on where we've come, perhaps from Paris or from any time frame you like, where we are now, uh, and, and whether we are anywhere near where we need to be. So I think when we look at the environmental transition, there are obviously several different chapters. And I think if, uh, and I think on some chapters, like nature, we are still behind where we need to go and where we need to be. But I think on other chapters like energy, um, we are actually really moving at speed and scale, which I think is still underestimated by people. And I think, you know, Obviously, we need to rely on, you know, I think policymaking has a really important role to play, and I think the discussions that are going on here at COP28 are very, very important. But, you know, we have to also face the reality is, which is that, you know, the funding of this transition is going to basically be carried by the private sector. So we basically need to, you know, encourage private sector capital to flow into this transition. This is only going to happen when we have visibility on better economic systems, i.e., you know, better aspect of the green economy. And that is already happening. So if we look at, for example, electrification or the transformation of energy systems, things are moving really fast. And capital is being deployed, I think, again, at speed and scale, which is underestimated by most people. Let me challenge you a little bit on that. When I look at the IEA numbers as well about um, overall spending, again, we're talking stratospheric numbers, aren't we? We're in the trillions of 
X trillion per year, and we'll leave it at that. Maybe it's five, maybe it's more, maybe it's less. But, but you say we are moving at speed uh, in spending the money on energy. Why is it that some very notable um, commentators say it's nowhere near as much in the right places? I think, again, we can discuss <coughs> whether this is, you know, we can discuss all the various sub-chapters of uh, aspect of this transition. But when you're looking at effectively the electrifying of our energy systems, which is really a demand side driven aspect, which obviously then uh, translates into the supply side. Um, you know, we, we, are, we, we think that we are on course in this decade alone to basically spend between three and three and a half trillion a year into the electrification of our energy system. Again, demand and supply side. So, you know, this is a number which um, which is actually quite encouraging. This is yeah. basically just to give you a sense of the scale. This is pretty much as much, it, it's pretty much like um, the amount that was spent in the last decade on the technology revolution. And we went from effectively, you know, technology driving 5% of earnings to technology driving 20% of earnings of our economy. And I think we have the potential to see something very, very similar when it comes to you know, the green economy and particularly the electrification and the transformation of energy systems. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Jennifer, let's get straight into you on this one, your own stock take. So, look, w we have a massive problem that we are really underestimating, right? I mean, that's really what we've learned over the past decade. The world uses 100 million barrels of petroleum every single day. We use that not just for electrification and power, we use that for fuels, we use that for chemicals, we use that to make all of our materials, we use that to make our food. So for us to bend the carbon curve, for us to have the impact that the IPCC says we need to have, which is an 8% year-over-year reduction, we've got to transform, massively transform our entire carbon economy, right? Have we done that? No. Are we prepared to do that? I see indications that we're starting to think that way. And I feel encouraged by the fact that there is this convening and 70,000 people showed up. Okay, that matters, right? The other thing that matters is we now have examples. I'll take a technology view, because that's where I live. And what you're starting to see is people understand what exponential growth looks like, right? We now know that 10 years ago we were making fun of solar, and now we can't turn around without seeing it. We know that computing, that all of these things don't grow linearly, they grow exponentially. And so I think what we're learning is, how does technology deploy? How long does it take? How much money does it take? And how do we get there from here? I believe technologies are gonna be very critical in bending the carbon curve. I think where our carbon comes from, has to change, and I think only technology can enable that. Um, this is the finance panel. The other one is the energy panel. Uh, no, 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 no. But, and, and, but, but you can't talk about one without the other. It's impossible. So some of the points I was going to make later on, I'm going to have to find something else to talk about, because I want to make the mail with you, Jennifer, as well. Is you talked about the 100 million barrels a day. Um, what if that industry can decarbonize? And you, you're the scientist, you're the engineer, you're the chemist as well. That is why they've been invited into the big tent as well. And again, I'll come to a lot of this a little bit later on as well. But, but is that money, which many people have said has to go on to pure renewables, is, if a lot of it is directed to decarbonizing the uh, fossil fuel, um, the molecules rather than moving on to electrons, is that money well spent? It absolutely is, and I, I, you know, the problem with doing something new is that every, you know, everybody's in the department of no. Everybody's in the why won't it work rather than how do we make it work. And I'll use an example, carbon direct air capture, right? Um, carbon engineering, which is owned by, by Occidental now, uh, Vicky. Vicky's oh, I, I spoke to Vicky about this a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so Vicky's one of the, I, in my mind, one of the great leaders of the decarbonization in, in the oil sector world. And, you know, people criticize her because what she's doing right now is she's using direct air capture to take more petroleum out of the ground. And, and that upsets some people, and perhaps it should. But the other way to think about it is, 
technologies need investment to get down the cost curve. So if the first thing she does is use it for EOR, she's still investing in director capture. She's still enabling director capture to become something that can be useful in five years' time. And that's what we need to applaud, not the immediate applications, but the vision of what can happen. But, uh, and I'll certainly come to you two gentlemen on, on your own initial points in a few moments' time, but, but, but does anyone want to reply to what Jennifer's saying and what I, I'm learning from that is actually a lot of money that could potentially, and we, we have a, there is a pool of capital and there's a vast pool of capital out there, and Henry will tell us more about the trillions that it is out there in a few moments' time. But if that money, that finance is being used on DAC at Oxy or CCUS at Exxon or some other carbon-related technology at one of the other majors or the NOCs, is that money that actually won't be used for renewables? But renewables is, is the power play, right? It's just, if you talk about renewables, technically it's, it's about getting green electrons, right? Green electrons aren't going to make your clothes. Green electrons aren't going to make your shoes. It's not enough, right? And so renewables per se doesn't solve our carbon problem. It's broader than that. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hogging you. You please. I, I'm please. hogging you because the other gentleman is just waiting to get away. But, but, but this is really important. It's such an important point. And I bow to a chemist about this as well and someone who knows this stuff way better than I ever would have. There are people out there, and we heard... Miss Thunberg, and she was passionate on that interview I did with her in Davos as well, and I was sweating, I had a big jumper on. And, anyway, and she was like, no molecules, it's electrons. But, 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 but we need some pragmatism on this, don't we? We do. 30% of the barrel is for materials, right? 30% it, it, of that 100 million barrels a day goes to making materials, to making stuff. I also, by the way, I'm a big fan of electrons. But the problem is... What we're sitting around saying is we don't have enough money to push every solution forward quickly. We're out of time. So if we're going to have to choose, we've got a problem. Or, or do we have enough money if the money and the rules by which we value that money are changed? And, and, and you've been, Henry, I, I'm, again, we first met at COP26 in Glasgow, and, and you taught me a lot about the investing universe and about the measures. And, and yet again, yes, and I'll just, um, so I dipped in very briefly yesterday into one of the panels you were on with Mike Bloomberg and Mark Carney about even better disclosure to help you, ladies and gentlemen, and the financial universe learn so much more. It's almost like an open source tool. I mean, you'll, you'll tell me, but, but I mean, you take your stock take and then take it where you want from this, Henry, because I, I, I feel I'm beginning to answer your questions. <laughs> So, so let, me, let me try to first frame the, the situation and then answer your question uh, directly. You know, sometimes when you interview different people, Darren Woods and other people uh, at the UN, et cetera, you know, they come from very different perspectives. But we all have to realize that what we're trying to do is a huge balancing act of every economy, every society, and the planet. And that is balancing three things you know, across the generations today and three things across the generations tomorrow. And the three things are economic growth, environmental sustainability, and energy security, right? The three E's, if you want to call them. And, and you want to balance them out between what you want to provide of those three things in the world today and what you want to provide tomorrow. So a lot of critics want to defund the oil and gas industry. If you do that, you're going to throw billions of people you know, into poverty and starvation, and the world will be very dramatically chaotic at the time. So how do we manage this transition in a way that we provide for the economic prosperity of the people on the planet today and the people on the planet tomorrow? This transformation of this $100 trillion economy is going to be the biggest transformation of the global economy in the history of humankind. Because, you know, if you look at economic history, the global economy never grew more than 20, 30, 50 basis points for millennia. It was not until the discovery of fossil fuels, coal first, oil, and then gas, that the economy began to grow three, four, four and a half percent. So we not now have to transform that $100 trillion economy into renewable energies. So how do we do that? You know, we clearly have to focus on the role of energy 
and technology and policy and all of that, but every economy runs on capital, right? Capital. No capital can do much. So what we need to focus on is the redirection of the mainstream of capital in the whole world from high climate risk, high carbon emission, you know, uh, sectors, industries, you know, securities or whatever, to lower ones. To do that, every economic system that runs on pre markets relies on information. No information, you can't navigate the, the plane, right? So the information is data, is, uh, is analysis, is research, is analytics, is models, and all of that. And without that, you can't navigate the, the ship or the plane, which is the global economy. So what we have today, unfortunately, is a very slow transition of the mainstream of capital in the world into the right places because they don't have the understanding of the risk and return associated with their investments because they don't have the data, the understanding of the risk, the understanding of the performance and all of that. So that is a problem because you know without that, we're not gonna be able to mobilize the mainstream of capital. I'm not talking about the fringes of capital. I'm talking about the main, the 120, 130 trillion dollars of professionally managed capital, you know, in the world. Just give so, us just, just give us that number again, because in the, in the world, it's big numbers. This is the biggest number. Yeah. 120, 120 tr tr trillion dollars. I, professionally I don't managed, interrupt your professionally flow, managed, right? Yeah. But, but, but being the, the interrupting flow person yeah. that I am, I will. Uh, that kind of money would solve every problem yep. in, well, we might create a bit of inflation, but if it was rightly directed. So right now it is misdirected and mispriced because of the lack of information. It's mispriced uh, because this problem is a lot bigger than most people really realize, and it's a lot shorter in duration in, our, uh, in front of us. The benefit of the uh, Paris Agreement that you were there was we pick a year, 2050. The curse of it is we pick a year of 2050 because uh, you go to an endowment, you go to a foundation, you go to a pension fund, and they think they have till 2050 to solve the problem. That's a big issue. So when this thing in the capital markets is already starting, you know, the reallocation gradually is already starting. So uh, we believe at MSCI that the vast majority of investment that are professionally managed today are mispriced to the climate risk and the climate opportunities in the world. I quote a KPMG study that was recently released in which uh, they interview institutional investors aggregating $35 trillion of assets. These are pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, foundations, $35 trillion in assets. And uh, to, the, to the, uh, the, the respondents of this survey, 85, depending on the asset class, whether it's public equities, you know, listed equities or non-listed equities, alternatives or bonds and all of that, depending on the asset class, the, uh, the respondents indicated that 85 to 92% of the, of the respondents indicated that depending on the asset class, those assets are mispriced today because of lack okay, of information. I know come in, no. and actually I'd be interested in your view on this one as well, Jose Manuel, before we get to your own stock take. Again, I, I'm staggered by what you've just said. So out of this enormous multi-trillion dollar pool of capital out there, most of it's wrong priced. I, I think I, I completely agree with what has just been said. I, I think there is a misunderstanding also about the way that this pool of capital functions. You know, as professional investment firms, you know, this capital doesn't belong to us. It belongs to our clients. And what this capital basically does is, is deployed into companies. So where the capital is going to flow in the transition is going to be mostly from companies investing into their own businesses and into new business models that are going to make sense economically. So the real question we need to ask ourselves when we think about the energy transition which is really a vast and complex subject, is you know, what are the new business models that are worth investing in today if you are corporate? Now, I think there are some really, really good news, which are, again, perhaps a little bit misunderstood. 
95% of our energy needs come from three things, and three things only, buildings, in industries, and transport. Now the good news is that we can see today a path to electrification transport, to electrifying transport. In fact, if we take light road transport, i.e. cars, you know, I think there is a wide consensus now that between now and 2030, we'll be selling basically between 60, 70, or 80 percent electrical vehicles as new cars. That's huge. If you, if you assume that the car industry is going to move towards electrical vehicles, this is 30 percent less demand from, you know, going to the oil industry. So the real question is that if you are going to electrify demand, we're going to need more and more electrons. And we're going to need to produce more and more electricity. And the good news is that the cheapest source of electricity on the planet today is solar, wind, and batteries. Nothing competes anymore. So we are creating a system where electrification, the need for electricity is increasing, which is great because any new electricity infrastructure is going to come from solar, wind, and battery because it's cheaper. And then you're creating a virtuous circle, which is basically a new economic system in which corporates want to deploy capital. And we financial investors are going to want to, f to follow those corporates that are basically creating business models that are going to grow faster, are going to be more profitable, and are going to be better. Shall I bring in at that point one of the most important sustainable infrastructure solutions <laughs> companies in Europe as well? You've been very patient, and actually you've had a good opportunity to listen to what everyone else is saying. So maybe quite sly putting you at the end as well. So very, very confused on what to deal with of the many things there. And that's why I'm going to give you a massive chunk now to talk about whatever you like. But first of all, actually, if we start off on your stock take, and then we can talk about the mispricing of companies, because I'm sure you've got a view on the latter as well. Okay, stock take. I mean, it's kind of thinking about that um, in quite depth. Where do we stand and where, we, where do we stand comparatively to my... I have a long history in this. I've been at it for now. This is my, like... 15th COP, and uh, I think we're at the beginning of the steep part of the of the hockey stick uh, hockey stick curve. I mean, I think we've been kind of struggling over the past 25 years, and I am I'm, I'm an optimist, of course, and I think we're getting there to the steep part of the hockey stick. Um, we definitely that's definitely happening in terms of renewables and the electrification of the economy, uh, what used to be kind of out of uh, a, a marginal part of the energy uh, system is now the, sing the most significant part, the, most, uh, the core of the energy system is being deployed to renewables. Uh, we're going to come out with a three time, uh, multiply by three the installation of renewables, electrify the economy. Um, increase the efficiency by two, so by a factor of two. Uh, so all of that, in my mind, it's kind of done. It's going to happen. That is going to happen. I have no doubt that's going to happen. I'm in the, I'm in the energy sector. I, I am a, you know, we are, Fiona is in the renewable energy sector, and I see the, the demand and the opportunity I see is uh, greater than ever, and greater than I've ever imagined in my in my wildest dreams. So I don't see that as a problem anymore, electrification. I mean, of course, there are regions, there are obstacles, there's permitting, there are grids, but they're all tangible physical problems that can be, can be um, reasonably easy um, tackled. Uh, particularly when you come from the old days when you were when I used to, my first uh, park, I'm sorry, I had to go a bit back, just, just to give it some flavor. My first um, wind, wind farm, it was in Tarifa, South Spain, and it was a very rudimentary uh, operation. When the blades broke, I had a friend at the beach who used to repair, who was uh, at school with me. This is 95, okay. uh, who used to be in school with me, and he'd gone windsurfer, but uh, he had a surfboard operation uh, repair a uh, little hut there so we took the blades down to my friend because he was the only one who can who could work with fiber i mean imagine that's what 28 years ago that's that's imagine what it was uh, the 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 state of the industry at that day i mean seeing what it is now to me it's kind of we've done it okay okay this is done next problem and next problem is what is the 
to me the challenge. What is the next problem? The next problem is hard to abate sectors. How do we do um, very, very, uh, very competitive uh, hydrogen? How do we convert into ammonia? How do we um, use the ammonia for shipping? How do we use the, how do we tackle water? The water problem, no one talks about the water problem. Too. I always use this, uh, this, uh, some of you have me that it's not very comprehensible, but I find it very graphic. Water is to climate change what uh, teeth are to a shark. Uh, I mean, water is what's really hitting us, either by excess or by defect, mostly by defect in most of the world, but by excess also. And that's what the impact on society is being most uh, felt in. Uh, and there is m so much to do in the water sector. Let's not get onto that. But anyway, point being, there is, we've, optimistic view, we are in the um, beginning of the up, uh, upper side, the steeper side of the, of the hockey stick curve. We are, uh, the electrification, the substitution of fossils for electricity is doable, it is going to happen. There is capital, there is capital, capital is there. IRA is a fantastic example of how a good deployment a uh, good political policy will deploy capital to, 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 to extents that we no, no one imagined was possible in such a short period of time. Uh, we need to focus now on the next uh, frontiers, and for me the next frontiers is water, hard to abate, um, definitely universal access, Comment on before, I know um, Jennifer and Henry both can come back in on this point as well, but did you want to comment on the mispricing of assets? Do you feel mispriced? I'm a great believer in markets. Um, but the markets don't have the right information. E well, they, they do have it. They, they may not uh, believe it. That's where the mispricing comes from. They're not yet sufficiently convinced that things are going to change at the speed that they will as to affect their models sufficiently. But I think that's changing. Um, I think that's changing. Every one of the panelists want to come back in again. Yeah, I remind you, if you, if you want to get involved, by all means, uh, what I'm going to do is just quickly, I'm going to go Henry, Jennifer, and then Hubert, because they, they got me before you did. <laughs> I become manic depressive many times. Um, <laughs> and the reason is that I think we're all right in the sense of it's just a question of how you view the picture, right? Uh, for sure, let's say compared to Glasgow to now, you know, we definitely have done a huge amount, you know, in the last few years. I mean, imagine just continental Europe being able to reroute their energy sources in such a short period of time is unheard of, you know. Uh, so from obviously Russian gas to gas from America and Norway and other parts of the world. So. The issue is we can pat ourselves in the back a great deal and we should and be optimistic by the progress we have made. The flip side of it, that's when it gets depressive, is the road ahead is enormously steep and big, right? So, so that's why, you know, look, so in, we at MSCI, you know, track the, uh, we, we actually estimate carbon emissions on 70,000 issuers in the world, companies and bond issuers and all of that. You know, only a small, small fraction of those 70,000 know what their carbon emissions are. If you go ask a company what their carbon emissions are, they have no clue. We create models to estimate it for, not for them, for the investors, but, but you know, for those companies or, or about those companies. Only a small fraction. So, yeah, the amount of information for markets to operate is minimal right now, you know. And the, the second point is the data is not perfect, so people may not believe it, you know, either, right? So, but going back to the, the world emits somewhere between 50 to 55 billion metric tons of carbon, you know, carbon emission or, or equivalent, somewhere in there. The listed companies of the world, meaning publicly listed in markets and all that, represent about currently 12, 12 and a half billion metric tons of the 50 to 55 billion. So say 20 to 25%, that's an estimate, right? So those listed companies increased their carbon emissions from last year by 11%.
So we're beginning to bend the rate of increase of the carbon emissions, but we're for sure not going down. We continue to go up. And our estimates is that 12 and a half billion metric tons of listed companies by the next 10, 15 years is gonna be 17, 18 billion metric tons. And the UN tells you, oh no, you gotta go up to 40 plus percent decrease you know, in the world. So if you get the market cap companies, you know, the listed companies in the world, uh, they're going in the opposite direction. So that's where the massive depressive is, right? You're slowing the, the rate of increase of the, of the curve, you're bending the curve, but you gotta bend it in a way that it goes down and we're far from getting it down. So, the only, the only, so I wanna go back to your question of can we do it all? So let me start there. So I can assure you nobody in this room loves a green electron more than I do. If I had green electrons, I could convert CO2 to everything we need, okay? I can tell you that. So, but all I want to communicate is that we've all learned that we need to decarbonize power. We all know that we're gonna electrify vehicles. But that car is still made of steel. That car still has polyester seats and it still has rubber tires. And so the question is not whether we electrify everything and utilize electrons, but rather, how do we decarbonize the whole system? That's the fundamental issue. And I will take one minute to just tell you about our technology for a second. We so get props as well, everybody. I, we did. We I, I it, hope the other gen the gentlemen have brought props as well, because they cool. were told to. <laughs> <laughs> so steel, hard to decarbonize sector. Carbon monoxide comes off a steel mill, is normally converted to a greenhouse gas and particulate emissions, right? hard to abate sector. We take that carbon that would go out the flue and we convert it to ethanol. We convert the ethanol to sustainable aviation fuel. We convert the ethanol to polyester. This pair of H&M pants, which was sold commercially in stores, was actually made with carbon emissions from a steel mill. Okay, we have Zara dresses, we have um, um, fleece, etc. So the point is, not what we spend our money in, but how we decarbonize the whole system by creating a circular carbon economy. We use carbon in a hard to abate sector, we use the waste carbon from there to make something else which decarbonizes that and keeps petroleum in the ground. That's the point. And before I bring, I bring Hubert back in, uh, just a couple of points. One, you, I did ask you to bring my size. <gasps> Next time, next oh, sorry. time, next I, I time. I know I needed the small, not the extra small. But anyway, that's okay. fine. <laughs> believe that, you believe absolutely anything. But more importantly, you said something absolutely pivotal. I could do anything with green electrons. Yeah. I could do anything with green electrons. So why can't you have, well, what, what, I think I know the answer, but I want you to tell me. What's the barrier to you having those green electrons? Cost. It cost. just costs. And that's what I thought. You're right. I need to get. And, and, but, but then that plus what Jose Manuel is saying about water. Uh, there's nothing new about desalination technology. But the reason why we have a problem with desalination is the same answer, isn't Power. it? It's cost. So why? why we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. I we're keep hearing there. that. We, just, uh, we have just, uh, we will start now uh, the building of a one of the biggest uh, desalination plants in the world in Morocco which is going to be totally green, totally um, uh, renewable supply. So we've got something enormous. It though. is the potential, the, 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 the technology, the availability of uh, energy, it's all there. We have it. It's just, just a matter of start pushing it and, and governments understanding that they have the opportunity and that they have the technology and that there is a, a, a green way of, um, of powering these plants and that uh, they need to get uh, the agricultural and this is going to be, it's an 800,000 cubic meter a day plant, which is amazingly big. It's going to supply Casablanca uh, for, uh, for use of water and irrigate 50,000 totally hectares. Totally green. And the All cost? The cost is going to be, I will probably won't say much to you, but it's uh, we're going to come out with about 40 cents a cubic meter? Compared to, let's say, what Singapore is doing or some of the more expensive uh, Compared to one and a half, uh, to one uh, euro, one dollar a cubic meter, which would be a standard price uh, for a desalination, one and a half to five years ago. And yeah. you said Morocco, which is very interesting because 
okay, it's a wealthy nation in some ways, but we're, I, I really think this conversation needs to talk about the global south axis, given that horrible number I said at the top about the small billions being uh, deployed to developing nations compared with the trillions being deployed in the wealthier nations as well. So again, green electrons uh, at cost, water at a cost that can have, th this is what scale does, isn't it? Isn't this the point, and I know I'll come back to you in a few, but I, I haven't ignored you, but, but scale equals lower cost. But may I ask, basic may I ask Jennifer, one doubt that I was left with here, why do you think um, cost is an issue right now with renewables or with um, green electrons? Because I actually don't just need the green electrons. To convert CO2, I need hydrogen. And then the combination of how cheap the electrons are that allow me to then use cheap water to make green, to make green hydrogen, that's actually what I really need. We've never had any energy in the world ever in the history of humanity that is cheaper than renewables are right now. Never in history. So it's the best starting point. I, I'm in that industry and I live through the whole uh, curve and I think we're in a, an incredible position to deploy uh, the most competitive energy available in the world, Jennifer. I think that's the... Yeah, I, I agree. We, it's, it's a nuance, right, around you get the electrons, then you make them cheap, and you get the electrolyzers and make them cheap so you can make hydrogen. So it's a I need the combination of the two. But to your point of green electrons, is that really true globally? Is, is it true in India, if I want to build a plant in India, that I have cheap green electrons today? Cheaper than ever. In India, you're getting the generation in India from wind and solar at say 50 euros, $50 a megawatt hour. Your alternative in coal is above 100. I stand well, corrected then. No, 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 but, no. but it's, it's, it's corrected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't seem to be able to. No, 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 It's difficult to scale. It's difficult to scale. That's true. Because there is permitting yeah. problems, yeah. So there is uh, administrative problems of every sort. Sure. But the technology is there. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, I, I, and I, I, all I'm saying is when I get them, they're not as cheap. Yeah. But, but. I'm, I'm happy for that to change. <laughs> you bet. You've been very patient. No, no, I don't have much to add. I, I think I, I would agree. I think, uh, uh, I think most of the issue is that when you do get effectively a completely electrified grid, then all these sort of technologies that are going to be required for the hard to habit sector will also, you know, the cost curve of these technologies is also going to go down. Um, I w just wanted to make two points. One is uh, to uh, Jose's point uh, early on, which I think is, is, uh, is really important, is you know, how does the market today look at this transition? And we should not ignore this because you know, we at Lombardier, we are an investment firm and we are really trying to help our clients navigate what Henry was saying was, is going to be the most profound economic transformation of all time. And so you know, the issue is that you know, if you look at clean energy space, so if you look at, frankly, the sustainability or the environmental transition from a market standpoint, it's been heavily punished in 2023. And it's been an incredibly difficult, you know, area to invest for, you know, generating return. And so the question that we are asking ourselves all the time is, you know, why and what the market is telling us about this transition, why is he reacting like this? And you know, what is really happening? And I think one of the things that we really need to spend a lot of time, which I think is often vastly underestimated, is that this transition towards effectively electron or new energy systems, on the one hand, is basically changing everything. It's changing entire economic systems. We're seeing that with electrical vehicles, but you know, we can talk about real estate, we can talk about many other sectors of the economy, it's changing profoundly entire economic systems. And in doing this, it is reconfiguring entire value chains. And in doing this, it's moving profit pools. So as an investor, when you are investing into, you know, aspect of a value chain today, you don't actually to know, you know, where profits are going to be moving along 
you know, tomorrow as this transition unfolds. So it's an incredibly difficult time to invest, and yet it is probably the most interesting time because this is, we are, if we look at 20 years ago, you know, the, the beginning of the internet revolution, you know, it's, there've been many, many failures Value chains have been reconfigured, reconfigured very substantially, but those who picked the Google and the Apple of this world, you know, have been, do have been doing really well. So I think that is an, another uh, important point to bear in mind on markets. And then to your point about global tax, where I have a slight disagreement here is that I think the, you know, we talk a lot about energy because we, everybody thinks that energy is at the source of the problem. But actually, you know, there's the biggest issue around nature. And when we talk about nature, we are immediately into a $10 trillion food systems. And food systems is actually much more damaging to the environment than energy. Yes, it is only 35% of uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions, but it's 90% deforestation, it's 50% soil degradation, it's 75% water issue, it's, it's just a massive negative environmental footprint. Now, you know, again, as an investment firm, we think that, for example, alternative proteins might be um, what solar, wind, and battery is to the energy system. So there are a number of things that are also happening um, in terms of new solutions, new technologies, which are going to have a really deep impact on nature and eventually nature assets. And the really good news for Global South is that you know nature assets for the vast majority sit in global south so there are potentially new economic systems like the energy system that might actually emerge and could basically power global south in a really interesting way um did you want to come in henry yeah so so i couldn't agree more what you're saying hober is that you know in a short span of time 10 15 years this is not like 30, 40, 50 years, we're gonna see enormous changes. Industries, companies, nation states, regions of the world are gonna get totally redefined, totally redefined. And there is a lot of uncertainty about that. So there's it's two problems. One, information, uh, but the information is not gonna give you 100% of the answer or anything like that. There is still a lot of uncertainty, so that Information plus uncertainty therefore paralyzes people to make to make decisions, you know, about about all of this. But that is the process. Now, go, going back to one of the questions that you know I saw in the in the panel is, how do you motivate people? How do you incentivize people? And you know, a lot of us, you know, a lot of us here are trying to incentivize people on the opportunity, right? On the promise, on the on the prospects. Uh, but a lot of people are incentivizing people on the risk. So when you do a performance evaluation of somebody, if you scare the person into something, if you spend all your time on what the person doesn't do well, that person is not gonna thrive. You gotta focus on what the person does well, what the person ha can improve in certain things and all of that. So anyhow, the motivation, these incentives are wrong, right? We gotta motivate people on the enormous opportunities that these changes bring the enormous profits that can be made, the enormous things as opposed to the risk only. Uh, I, I actually want to bring you on, on an invasion in a few moments. I want to bring Jose Manuel on taxonomy. And I've also had a couple of requests for questions from the audience as well. So if you do want to get a question in, just let me know. I already know two ladies who are going to ask me questions as well. Tell us a little bit about taxonomy as well and how you frame this, uh, Jose Manuel, as well, because meant to define um, sustainable investing as well. Do we need, would it be part of the reframing of the, the psyche to investing if we understand a taxonomy a little bit better? It's a step, it's a very important step towards mispricing. Um, and uh, actually, I, it's spreading around the world. It's a, it's a, it's a European, investment, uh, European invention. Basically, what it does is it um, orders out what investments are green, are um, contributing to decarbonization and uh, which are neutral and which are negative. So basically it's a list, it's a long list of activities that has simplified the investment um, scenario significantly and it's being adopted by, this is in fact a Macron uh, initiative of, I don't know, nine, 20, 20, 
13, 14, something like that. I remember having the first meeting of this and it took like 10 years to get it done or eight years, but it's done. And now it is extremely effective and it's spreading around the world. That I think would contribute enormously to, uh, to the mispricing problem. So now we're really getting somewhere because if we have, which is also part of a Macron initiative, the NZDPU as well, the Nash, uh, Net Zero Data Public Utility, which is this open source where everyone's got the right data, then they can grade everything correctly, then that makes your life easier, and then we can direct it to innovators such as yourself. This is getting somewhere as well. Right, okay, uh, this lady here has a question, then this lady here, um, we'll just get these questions in because I, I, well, we've got 11 minutes, we're doing really well, we're doing really well. I haven't even mentioned carbon credits yet and a whole host of other things as well. And if we don't get there, that's good because it means we've had a good chat. So we're responsible for about one and a half of those trillions everybody's talking about. So first of all, uncertainty. This is the day job of an investor. So Yogi, Yogi Berra, the um, baseball player, put it so well. He said, the future's uncertain because it hasn't happened yet. But that is actually how you make money, by taking risks. So markets need two things, information, Investors, as you rightly say, and largely ignore what companies produce because it's not verified, it's not integrated with the financials, and it's not timely. So, you know, all praise to the work MSCI is doing. It's fantastically important. But we don't have in we, – we're just at the point of getting standardized information that regulators approve of. So we're right at the very beginning of that. So on the information part that markets need, we're, we're just about to take off. So I agree, it's exponential. However – turn to the second thing markets need, and this is my question, is in information is number one, the second is incentives. And we're all talking about, um, uh, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act in Europe and what's going on across Asia, this is wonderful. But the real skew embedded in the economics is subsidies for fossil fuels. So how do we, they're much bigger. Five and ten trillion dollars a year. technology and I don't think it's the lack of money, it's not the lack of finance, it's not the lack of science. Now we're really talking about the complexity of human policy making. So if we can sort the subsidies for fossil fuels out, we wouldn't be counselling so much of public money which is going into uh, basically pricing externalities is the way economists would see. You know, carbon gets a free ride right now. All we're doing with things like carbon pricing is full freight ticket for carbon. That will transform the economics. But the subsidized ticket for carbon is coming through the fossil fuel subsidy. What do we do about that? Thank you so much for your intervention. Really nice. And the lady behind you as well in a few moments' time. But let's get a couple of answers on this one. Who would like to pick up on this one? Jennifer, did you want to say something? My head. <laughs> but okay, well, but love, no, no, no. But but, but let me. I don't have an answer, but I have a. I mean, uh, where's me? Let me bring you to the. Re uh, remind you, which probably you don't need to. I don't need to. Um, the reality of um, desubsidizing the 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 the, the, the carbon emitting industry is gilet jaune. That is the example. Gilet jaune. I mean, how do we deal with that? Is it? Well, exactly. That's my point. So the so problem is enormous so because we're fighting. Uh, we're fighting voters, and uh, we're fighting. Uh, we're fighting votes. I mean, how do we deal with that? I am hugely concerned about that, and I don't know how. I honestly don't know who is the politician who is in a democracy ready to undertake that uh, that cost, that social cost because it definitely you has a lot. politician on, on, on the panel, because uh, it's something that's come up, even at meetings, I've had closed door meetings at the IEA um, with a whole host of um, top energy leaders, politicians and, uh, as it were, IOCs at the time, or NOCs, and they say time and time again to the politicians, be honest with your population. Be honest with your population. The whole idea of the just transition, which is what we really yeah, need. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uber. I mean, they ignored it. And they 
Jennifer, did you want to come in on this one? Yeah, I just want to make a minor comment. Sure. Okay. The minor comment is fundamentally what you said is, is a real problem for us developing new technology because the question we always get asked is, when is your technology going to be cost competitive with petroleum? Yeah. And the answer I want to say is if they didn't have the massive investments, I'm competitive today. But, but the, that is a real problem that needs to be changed. And we depend on early adopters who say, well, if you double the price of my polyester, it's okay because I've embedded that in the cost of the garment. But you can't depend on the early adopters if you want to get everybody, if you want to change everything. So your problem is and mitigator, Israel. And mitigator, yeah. not a solution, but mitigator may be uh, carbon credits. Um, certificates of every sort. That may be a mitigator because you may not take up yeah. out the. We may get some news on that in the next couple of days. Hubert, um, yeah. are you coming next and then Henry? Um, sure, very quickly. It was just uh, on one of the earlier points. Um, you're talking also about tax taxonomy and you're talking also about information. Um, I think we, in the investment world, it's really important that we make a distinction between what a green investment is, which is where the taxonomy is helping and what green returns are. And those are two very different things. And we should be very clear that, again, the fiduciary duties of the 120 trillion, which we proudly look after in some way, shape, or form, is about green returns. It's just about returns. So it's, it's really important because if we, don't, if we don't sort of keep that investment return discussion, we will lose our clients. And so it's really important that we make a distinction. There are some green businesses that are fantastic, but frankly, they are not investable. And there are some, you know, I would say businesses that are really going to benefit from the green transitions. And those are, very, those are two different concepts. And then to the point about information, this is absolutely correct. We have more and more information, more and more standardized information, but we have to be also honest with ourselves. Our industry is not equipped to deal with all of this information yet. We are still too verticalized in the way that we're looking at industry and sectors. You know, if we look at automotive, you know, we think about automotive as an industry. We have completely failed as, a, as our own industry to realize that, for example, with Tesla, it is basically not the automotive industry anymore. It's about supplying electrified equipment. It's a completely different industry. And we need to sort of try to break the silos that we have created for ourselves over so many years. I'm going to have to move on. Uh, I've, I've, there's so many topics I haven't done. We've got four minutes, 30 seconds, and another question, and Henry's answer. Briefly, <laughs> uh, it goes back to the Balancing Act. You can take a lot of benefit from, pro from the prosperity of the current population and sell them for its future population. It's really hard. That's why, you know, even though it was Paris, even though it's France, they said, no, don't mess around with my, you know, my gas prices. And the second thing is, I, the second point that I made is, you got to motivate people positively. Not, you can't motivate too many people negatively. So you got to come up with a renewable alterna alternative to those people so you can take their gas a car away, you know, if you don't provide the alternative, they're not going to move. Right? Yeah. And yet, how brilliant were we when we had this devastating war on our continent beginning 24th of February last year? How good were we at conservation of our energy? We didn't need quite as much, and hence our bills went down. Well, they went up because of the price, but they, did, they could have gone down if it was just about supply and demand. This lady here has been very patient. Well, thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here. I am with NTT. My name is Rika Nakazawa, part of the New Ventures and Innovation Group, and also leads sustainability innovation. So I'm so excited to hear about technology and innovation and all the enablers that are happening there. And uh, as you can imagine, one of the big topics that I've been thinking about quite a bit is artificial intelligence. And just to read a one statistic, I know there's all kinds of data, but a continuation of the current trends in AI capacity and adoption are set to lead to NVIDIA shipping 1.5 million AI server units per year by 2027. These 1.5 million servers running at full capacity would consume at least 85.4 terawatt hours of electricity annually, more than what many small countries use in a year, according to the new assessment. Now, full disclosure, I'm former NVIDIA alumni and was part of the group that was creating these chips that is now driving the Tegra um, ev evolution or revolution, however you like to see it. And I think about what Elon Musk said at DealBook a few days ago, and the headline that did not make the news no, no, no. The other headline that did not make the news was around the, the ask that Andrew asked Elon said, 
when do you think that we'll have AI enable uh, computers to be smarter than humans? And Elon Musk said three years, roughly. And so if we take that data point, and as you were saying, humans get, paraly get paralysis from too much information, too much data, you're a big believer in markets, and so on. So is the invisible hand going to be AI of the future? Will AI be the new invisible hand that will help markets in this green transition be more Perfect. optimal? And yeah, so yeah, I'd love your feedback on, a on I AI. I need final rounds. Well, who wants to pick up on AI and the benefits that can happen? Is it, gonna, is, it is, is it doing anything in your world at the moment in making investment decisions? Uh, too early. Too early for you. Henry? Is it? Um, Major transformation, obviously, yeah. because you know data information and all of that it will be significantly enhanced by AI. One other quick thing is, when you go to the big strategy consulting firm, they thrive on tra on transformation and change. That's what they advise you know companies on and governments on strategy. One of the big ones told me that their whole strategy to advise their client is based on two pillars: climate change and AI, because that's going to lead to the biggest transformation. Jennifer, you're you're the scientist amongst us. AI. Well, we use AI to genetically modify our bacteria. Yeah. It's embedded in, in how we reprogram the bacteria to make other products. Uh, so I have no other comment other than that it's essential it's to the future. It's changing a lot. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the question. You may be a, an NVIDIA AI um, uh, alumni. I hope you still got your shares. Um, f f f I, I will get shot and not be allowed to do my next panel if I'm too much over. I'm going to go a couple of minutes over. Don't worry, Emily. No, one minute over. That's right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> She's just told me no. Um, very quickly then, uh, COP28, is it going to deliver on finance? I'll just have one quick round through because I've got 43 seconds left. Emily's very kindly told me I can have an extra minute. She didn't really. Uh, Jose Manuel, why don't you start off? Is COP going to deliver what we need to see this time round uh, on finance? Um, I'm not sure it's going to deliver uh, specifically on finance. It's going to deliver in what COPs deliver most, which is global awareness and uh, conviction and more people uh, when we st first came and I'll, I'll finish this when I first went to COP it was like 150 companies private companies this year is something like 17,000 or so so yeah I think it will help Henry it will deliver some but the expectations are high too high no they they're proper uh, they're not too high but it's a journey Investment. No. We have to travel that money to innovators. Can it, is it showing anything that you need to see? But actually it is, because what they're starting to talk about is how to scale. More yeah. and more financing yeah. going to scaling, which is important, and that is coming out of COP. And Hubert? I completely agree with what was said before, and um, I think one important point is uh, it's increasing awareness of the world. Um, I, I've taken up as much of time. Emma I'm in such trouble as well. Emma has got to get it back on track in a few moments' time. I, I love this event, and I love speaking to you all. And honestly, and I love the, the, the warmth and the, and the brilliant conversation we had. We didn't cover carbon credits. We didn't actually get to an in-depth conversation uh, about iron that, but I think we covered an awful lot of points in one hour as well. Uh, and I will just leave with one word before I thank the panel as well. One of the comments... Um, from Henry it was, this is the biggest transformation the global economy, humankind has ever seen, period. What an opportunity. Why don't you join me and thank this amazing panel, Jose Manuel, Antra Canales, <laughs> Jennifer Holmgren, Henry Fernandez, and Uber Keller as well. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much indeed as well. And Steve, thank you very much as well. That was a really interesting panel. Thank you so much. And you're, you're back later, I know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you off later, don't you worry. Um, well, the good news is Steve, <coughs> excuse me, Steve will be rejoining us uh, in about an hour or so with another panel. So do uh, make sure you uh, stay with us for that. And we're just going to do a little bit of shuffling of seats and wait for everyone to come and settle down now. Because we have uh, another really interesting conversation coming up next, ladies and gentlemen. Our, um, our next guest is in the business of making...